All right. So thank you, everyone, for, um, for coming tonight, um, for joining us for um, this talk from Susan Ruth. We're really um, happy that she was able to do this with us. It's one of the uh, few perks of the world that we find ourselves in these days is that we can have someone um, like Susan um, join us from her home in Maryland and we can bring it to all of you guys in your houses, um, you know, safe and comfortable. So um, we're really happy to be able to do that. Susan has written a wonderful book, which is available for pre-order right now and will be out in the next few weeks. Um, it's called um, Mayflower to Michigan and Beyond My Family's Journey. So she's got like 400 years of history here to share with us from her family. They've just done a wonderful job of capturing um, the history of their family um, coming to this country and, um, and then more specifically to our area, to Buchanan um, and Chicago and kind of just our um, greater area. She's got a lot of stories and specifically she's going to share with us some stuff about the women in her family. So I'm real um, happy that we get to have this special presentation just for our library. So I thought I would really quickly read for you um, one of the reviews on the back of um, Susan's new book, which is from the executive director of the Berrien County Historical Association. Um, she says, this book exemplifies the museum curator's quest to bridge local stories to, a larger, national, to larger national narratives. Susan Ruth uses family memoirs and milestones to flesh out familiar American stories such as the Mayflower, westward expansion, wartime challenges, the immigrant experience, and evolving women's roles. Individual and family tales, like those in this book, enrich our collective history. Ruth's thoughtfully told family stories span four centuries and range from inspiring to humorous. We are excited to add this narrative to the Berrien County Historical Association's collection. All right, so um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Susan now. And I will, um, I'm gonna mute everybody just so you know, um, so we don't have any distractions. Um, but if you have questions, please add them to the chat. And at the end, I will be happy to ask them um, and Susan will answer them. Thank you, and I'll turn it over now to you, Susan. Thanks, Meg. I am so pleased to be here today. And I've chosen to share stories about five remarkable stay unmuted here. They are among dozens of family members who are featured in my new book, uh, Mayflower to Michigan and Beyond My Family's Journey. Names can be confusing because some people were married a couple times. There's a middle name, there's a first name. So I'm going to use only the first name of each woman or the first and maiden name. Maria Kepner and Henrietta Sharp are the first two I'm going to tell you about. They are they settled in Chicago. And um, actually in the presentation, that's not going to be met in that particular order. But as you look at this map, Maria and Henrietta are settled in Chicago. And on this slide, they're shown west of Lake Michigan in the general area of Chicago. Lydia Ann Harding settled in Buchanan, where her daughter, Maud Mowry, was born. They're shown on this map to the east of Lake Michigan in the general area of Buchanan. The fifth woman is my mother, Bonnie Wells. She saw herself as a bridge between city life in Chicago where she grew up and Buchanan where she spent summers as a child and later returned with my father to raise my siblings and me. So she's shown at the bottom of the screen because of her connection to both Chicago and Buchanan. These five women showed amazing resilience in the face of life's challenges. Four of them became widows at an early age and all of them adapted to changes in circumstances that upended their lives. The first three stories I'm going to share with you begin in 1862 during the early days of the Civil War. It's fitting to start with Lydia Ann Harding as our first remarkable woman because she was a Mayflower descendant as am I, since she is my great-great-grandmother. Lydia Ann was the sixth great-granddaughter of Richard and Elizabeth Warren. Richard, a London merchant, was a passenger on the Mayflower. We always hear about the pilgrims who came for religious reasons. He came for economic reasons. On December 18th, just a little more than a month from now, 
the country will celebrate the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower landing at Pilgrim Rock. Richard stepped off the ship shortly thereafter. Elizabeth and their five daughters had remained in England and they arrived three years later. Lydia Ann was also the fourth great granddaughter of Abraham Harding. He was only four years old when he sailed with his family into Boston Harbor in 1623. After a harsh New England winter, the Hardings sailed back to England in its milder climate. When Abraham was 19, he returned alone and, and stayed. After over the next 180 years, the Warrens and the Hardings intermarried with many other old New England families. In fact, Emily Dickinson was a cousin on Lydia Ann's father's side, and Henry David Thoreau and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow were cousins on her mother's side. Lydia Ann Harding, with her husband, Dr. William Remington, a dentist, and their two young sons arrived in Buchanan in 1862. Three years after they arrived, William died at the age of 32. Lydia Ann was suddenly a 32-year-old widow, far from home, with two young sons, Oren and Elmer. Only a couple of weeks later, Lydia Ann's father also passed away. Her mother came to live in Buchanan to help raise the two boys. Lydia Ann may have had financial support from her extended family in Western New York State, where she had come from, and from Boston. Nevertheless, she and her mother were very much alone in their new village. Lydia Ann didn't stay a, bit of a widow very long. Also living in Buchanan was Hiram Mowry, and I wish I could have met him. He was a successful blacksmith in businessman. His family of German descent had first arrived in Philadelphia in 1743. He grew up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia where he had worked on the family farm and learned blacksmithing. He's shown here in this slide in his full Masonic regalia. Hiram and his first wife, Jane Reedy, had three daughters under the age of 10. Only two months after Wilming Remington passed away, Jane died, leaving Hiram a widower with three children to raise. And I'm gonna pause here a moment because I just got a text from Jerry Flanner who said it sounded like he was trying to join. So I just thought, Sarah, if you could look out for him, that would be great. Although Hiram had trained as a blacksmith, he was also a serious musician who loved to play his fiddle for family sing-alongs and social events. He once told his granddaughter that he had gotten tired of plowing rocks in Virginia. So he packed up his fiddle and a few worldly goods and headed west. When he arrived in Buchanan in the 1850s, he decided to put down roots and set up his blacksmith business. Family accounts tell us he was a joyful man who loved children, loved storytelling, music, and his community. So two years after the death of their spouses, Lydia Ann and Hiram married, blending their families of two boys and three girls. And during their marriage, they had four more children, all girls. This slide shows a picture of all the Maori children. One daughter, Florence died as a teenager. She is shown here in Oren's lap. The other eight children remained close throughout their lives. My great-grandmother, Maud Mowry, is the mischievous looking little girl on the lower left side of the picture. She is one of my five remarkable women and you'll hear her story later in the presentation. Lydia Ann lived into the 20th century long enough to enjoy her youngest grandchildren. She is shown in this old photograph, very faded, holding my grandmother, Aline, on her lap. Lydia Ann also wrote regularly to her grandchildren. In one letter to her granddaughter, Hazel, she commented, commented that she hoped to have the family home for Christmas, a wish that certainly all of us share this year. Here is what she said. 
I would love to, I would be glad, brother, I would be glad to see you all out here Christmas. We haven't planned any Christmas dinner, but if you folks will come, we'll have something, especially if grandpa can catch a raccoon. Baked raccoon was a special holiday treat in Hiram Maury's home state of Virginia. Our family laughs that nothing says Christmas like baked raccoon. The young widow from New England and the young fiddler and blacksmith widower from the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia had had blended their families and their cultures. In 1862, Lydia Ann's family had been living in America for more than 240 years. Our next remarkable woman, Henrietta Scharf, had lived in this country only two years. Born in the Kingdom of Prussia in 1843, Henrietta was orphaned at the age of 14. She had to quit school and become a nanny in order to survive. Unfortunately, there are no pictures of Henrietta in our family archives. According to stories told by one of her grandsons, one of Henrietta's uncles had moved to Chicago from Germany where he owned a cigar store. Henrietta's uncle and aunt sailed back to Germany regularly to visit the spas in Baden-Baden. This is in 18, in the 18, right around 1860. He clearly had done well in his adopted country to be able to vacation in his homeland. On one of his return trips to the United States, the couple listed Henrietta, now 17 years old, as their daughter. So she was really an illegal immigrant. She brought with her a Prussian identity document proving her recent employment as a kindermädchen which is a German word for nanny. That document, along with Civil War diaries and letters and many, many photographs were in the family archives that I inherited from my mother. Henrietta also carried with her one trunk and a cloth doll. After Henrietta arrived in this country, she quickly learned to read and write, a testament to her intelligence. Unfortunately, she was never able to continue her formal education. Six years later, in 1866, Henrietta married Louis Breck, a boot and shoemaker. And as a quick aside, in Chicago in 1866, there were not many, if any, paved roads. So I'm sure that his bestsellers were the boots as you walked through the muds in the street, the mud in the streets. This slide is a copy of his company's invoice. He had recently returned from fighting as a Union soldier during the Civil War, through which he earned his American citizenship, something that still happens today. He suffered lung damage from sleeping on the cold ground, unfortunately, during his service. Between 1869 and 1872, Lewis and Henrietta had three daughters, including my great-grandmother, Amanda Breck. As Lewis Breck's business grew, the family moved further south in Chicago from 18th Street all the way to 38th Street in Wabash. That's east of present day I-94. In June of 1875, Henrietta and Lewis's only son, Edward, was born. Just three months later, Lewis, the father, died at the age of 36, probably from his damaged lungs. Once again, a young widow was left to raise children alone. In the case of Henrietta, her four children were all under the age of six when her husband died. None of the children was old enough to take over the family business. Henrietta called on the survival skills she learned as a teenager in Prussia and cleaned office buildings and saloons in the evening to earn enough money to raise her children. As teenagers, the children began to contribute to the family income. Uh, imagine this, teenagers. By the time Edward was 14, he had a full-time job working as a clerk. His sister, Laura, worked for a company owned by a Breck relative, and 20-year-old Emma, was a photograph retoucher, a relatively new profession 
as photography's popul popularity grew. When the Dependent Pension Act of 1890 was enacted, Henrietta began receiving a widow's pension of all of $8 a month. She was awarded an additional $2 a month for her son Edward until he reached the age of 16. Although the pension was obviously critical income for many families, not just the Brecks, the law was considered by some to be too expensive. With her pension and the children's contribution from the jobs, their financial burdens began to ease. An unlabeled family photograph shows two of the Breck children, Edward and Laura, relaxing in a park with friends. We don't know the identities of all the others, although one of the men in the back sitting next to Laura was a family dentist, that's all we know. Their clothing indicates though that the family had become more comfortable. A third daughter, my great-grandmother Amanda, married William Adam Hetler in 1889, and Hetler is my maiden name. She was only 19 years old. William became a well-loved sergeant in the Woodlawn, which is a suburb of Chicago, a Woodlawn police force. And he also invested in real estate in the rapidly growing south side of Chicago. I'm focusing here on the women, but he is one of the most wonderfully interesting characters in my background. I won't dwell on him, but when he retired, he um, started a goat dairy. He started a goat farm, raised goats and had a dairy and his milk was sold all over the countryside in biplanes. He was quite a, quite a character. And as you can see in this next slide, William and, uh, William and Amanda in their 1906 automobile, the company, the couple prospered and they provided financial support to Henrietta for the rest of her life. Although Amanda, my great grandmother lived to be 90, at 76, I'm sorry, 76, her three siblings all died before the age of 40. Their early childhood of poverty likely contributed to their early deaths. Henrietta, the mother, showed courage and determination as a young orphaned immigrant and later in the face of tremendous loss, losing three out of her four children. They all died before she did and they all died before the age of 40. She, on the other hand, enabled her daughter, Amanda, to have a good life in America. Amanda, in turn, cared for her mother in her later years. Henrietta Scharf passed away in 1931 when she was 88 years old. Our next remarkable woman is Maria Kepner. And I must admit that the Kepner family are among my favorites. She's also a second great grandmother. Her story takes a little longer to tell because she had a long life. She lived to be almost 100 filled with adventures and adversity, She's a mark, remarkable woman. She was born in Chester County, Pennsylvania, 40 miles northwest of Philadelphia. Her Kepner ancestors had arrived in Philadelphia from Germany in 1715. Maria's mother's family owned a large farm equipment company similar to John Deere today, and they were prominent citizens in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. This slide shows an advertisement of a thresher from the company's catalog. Two horses walked on a treadmill to power the thresher. The family's company, Ellis Keystone Agricultural Works, continued to adapt its equipment to steam and then internal combustion engines into the 20th century. Eventually, the company was sold. And I think actually it may have been sold to John Deere. In 1862, the same year that we discussed the other two women, during the Civil War, Maria was a 25-year-old volunteer nurse, single, living at home in Chester County. More than 70 years later, when she was 95, she told a Chicago newspaper reporter that she, and this is a quote, scraped lint, made bandages from bed linen, and crocheted woolen socks from the fringe of my mother's great red and white crocheted afghan. 
she and a friend were granted permission from the military governor to travel to Virginia. Think of this, this is just west of Philadelphia down to Virginia during the Civil War to deliver the bandages and to sit with injured soldiers. In my book, I share some of the letters that her brother Price sent home from the front where he was a member of the Virginia Lancers, a cavalry corps, and then later managed Virginia field hospitals. It's possible, but we don't know, that Marie delivered the bandages to one of his hospitals. Shortly after returning home from Virginia, she trained to be a telegraph operator to replace men who were fighting for the Union. This slide is a recreation of that her position as a telegraph officer. For the same newspaper article, Maria reenacted one of the most exciting days of her life. I will quote what she told the reporter. I was at home on that morning when an office boy called on me at about seven o'clock to tell me President Lincoln had been assassinated. He had read the message as it was ticked off by the wire from Washington but was not allowed to touch the sending instrument at our relay station. I ran all the way to the office to send out the message. Then I sent the boy to tell everyone in town. Maria went on to tell the reporter, then as now, there were many who would not take the word of a mere woman. They went all the way to Philadelphia to find out for themselves that I was right. That story provides a glimpse of Maria's personality. Maria Kepner married George Washington Reagan in 1865, shortly after he returned from his tour of duty in the Civil War. His ancestors, as you can tell from his last name, had arrived from Ireland in the late 1700s. They clearly thought a lot of President George Washington. George joined her family's farm equipment business and they settled in her hometown. Their first child was born the next year followed by two more boys and then two girls, one of whom was my great-grandmother, Anna Reagan. The sixth child, Howard, was born in 1878. And let me give you an alert, this is a sad story. When Howard was only one month old, his father was killed when the gale of 1878 collapsed the roof on the family's farm equipment warehouse. He was only 43 years old. My great-grandmother Anna was three years old when her father died. In her memoirs, she stated that her father had recently suffered financial losses, leaving the family with no apparent means of support. The country was in the middle of what is now called the Long Depression. It lasted for about 20 years. The family business was probably devastated by the economic climate, that made it difficult for farmers to invest in new equipment. Maria, a widow with six children under the age of 10, received a letter from her younger brother Price, a Civil War veteran who worked for the Surgeon General in Washington, DC. He had written to her throughout the war and now offered condolences. She kept his letter dated October 25th, 1878, throughout her life. It is passed from generation to generation, faded and taped in a few places. I would like to share part of it with you. My dear sister, words are inadequate to express how deeply and sincerely my heart goes out in sympathy for you. Pardon my absence from the late sad funeral rite to the departed. It, had ne it is needless to assure you that it is not enforced by want of brotherly love, nor untouched sensibilities of deep affection. Let me retain remembrances of him while he was in the enjoyment of life and to add my assurances of future assistance to my widowed, widowed sister your brother Price. Sadly, that offer to help was short-lived because Price died only three years later in 1881 
when he was just 40 years old. Maria faced very difficult decisions after her husband's death. She sent the three oldest children, all boys, to live with relatives and friends. They were apparently not all together because at some point the youngest was in a boarding school in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, which is just outside Philadelphia. Maybe pronounced Kutztown, Kutztown. My great grandmother and her sister moved to a Presbyterian home in Philadelphia. Howard, only one month old when his father died, stayed with his mother until at least the age of two. At some point, we don't know when, he was placed in Girard College, a boys' home in Philadelphia that still exists today. It took nearly 10 years before Maria could gather her family all together again. During that time, her much younger brother, he was 17 years younger, Ellis Webster Kepner, who was known as Webster, had become the private secretary to Illinois Governor Richard Oglesby. Webster encouraged his sister to move to Chicago because he had contacts there, where he found her an apartment and jobs for her two older sons. Note the gentleman in the background of this photograph. He's standing next to a table. The equipment on the table is an old copying machine. Thomas Jefferson also had one of these in his office in Monticello. As Maria started to bring her family together, she first sent for her 18-year-old son who had been in boarding school. Then in September 1888, almost 10 years after her husband had been killed, nine-year-old Howard, who is still at Girard College, passed away without ever living with his family again. At that point, Maria decided that she had to bring all her family together at whatever cost. Her two daughters, now in their early teens, joined the rest of the family in Chicago. Much of what we know about the life of Maria and her family comes from her great, my great-grandmother Anna's memoirs, which are included in the book. I will read an excerpt here to give you a flavor of how everyone in the family worked together to create a new life in Chicago. Imagine the effort involved in just putting food on the table. Here are Anna's recollections of what was required. With six in the family, three, three of whom carried lunches, it meant a great deal of marketing, cooking and baking, and it was necessary to make the most of every penny. Our only income was what the three boys contributed from their salaries. My mother, with one of us children, whoever happened to be at home at the time, made a weekly trip to the stockyards and bought enough meat to last the better part of the week. By buying a whole loin of pork, we could get it for from five to eight cents a pound and other meats accordingly. We could get turkeys for from 12 to 14 cents a pound. We made scrapple every winter. We canned, preserved, and made jelly whenever we could get fruit and vegetables at a bargain. The boys would often bring home a crate of fruit, such as strawberries, raspberries, and cherries on Saturday afternoons, and we would all get busy and help prepare it for canning or preserving. It was necessary to bake twice a week, and we always baked from six to eight big loaves of bread, two or three Dutch cakes, and pies and cheese and molasses cakes. We bought flour by the barrel and potatoes by the bushel until we decided it was too much trouble to bring the potatoes in off the porch every night in winter and to find a place to keep the flour. In 1890, like Henrietta Sharp, Maria filed for a pension based on her husband's Civil War service. Once again, the Dependent Pension Act of 1890 provided a safety net for my ancestors. The pension and renting out a bedroom provided additional income to support the family. Maria's younger brother, Webster, also visited regularly and was a continuing source of financial help to his older sister and her family. In addition to challenges of day-to-day -day living, Maria's daughter 
and a including vice dancing with her uncle Webster at the opening of the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Maria Kepner, who showed bravery and gumption during the Civil War and demonstrated determination and resilience throughout her long life. After the death of her husband and younger son, and with the help of her loving, much younger brother, she built a new life for herself and her children in the growing city of Chicago. She lived to be 99 years old and was a role model for her children and all of her descendants. We cross Lake Michigan now and return to Buchanan to share the life of Maud Mallory, Lydia Ann's daughter and my great-grandmother. She was the young mischievous girl in the photograph of the blended Mallory family. Maud Mallory was born in 1873 in Buchanan, Michigan, six years after Lydia and Hiram married. After Maud graduated from Buchanan High School, she earned a teaching certificate, probably at Northern Indiana Normal School in Valparaiso, Indiana. Normal schools provided basic principles of education and attracted primarily young unmarried women who could then teach elementary and, or primary school until they married. And actually my kindergarten teacher had graduated from a normal school. She didn't have a four year college education. Uh, I went to a one room school south of Buchanan. Maud gave up teaching when she married Dr. Lester Peck in 1895 at the age of 22, but she never stopped learning. She had her first child, Aline, who was my grandmother, one year later. Near the turn of the century, Maud's sister Ida joined with several other women to form a ladies club. The, object, the objective was to maintain the Eastern cultural standards of their ancestors and to expand their knowledge of history and literature. At the first meeting, the new club decided to study French history and named a committee to organize the programs. At the second meeting, the members agreed to call their group the 30 Club and decided to limit the membership to 30 women, a tradition that still exists today. Continuing education has been a central part of the club's purpose throughout its history. Music was also important. Several times a year, 30 club members put on performances in Buchanan's Opera House. Our family archives include several photographs of Maud, Ida, and family members in these musicales. When Aline was three years old, Maud delivered twins named Doris and Donald. They were so small when they were born that their first beds were shoe boxes. With three small children and a growing medical practice, the Peck family seemed poised for a wonderful new century. Sadly, that was not to be. When Donald was two years old, he dropped a rock on his head when he was playing in the yard. Although Donald's father was a doctor, he was unable to save his baby son, who died two days later from brain damage. The family grew again with the birth of Edwin in 1902 and John in 1905. And thanks to the archivist at the Buchanan District Library, we have this photo of Lester Peck and his two young daughters preparing for an annual Memorial Day parade. It was probably taken about the same time that Edward and John were born, somewhere in that time period. With two daughters and five sons, the house was once again filled with joy. In this photo taken around 1911, Lester Peck stands in the back with one daughter on each side. Maud sits in the front with a son on each side. I feel like I'm repeating this story, the happiness did not last. Five years later, Lester Peck knew he was not well and visited Mayo Clinic. He learned that he had terminal stomach cancer and passed away shortly after Christmas, 1916. In addition to Lester's medical practice, he was the village president and he had helped bring Clark equipment to Buchanan. 
Although the family lost the income from his medical practice, his investments in Clark equipment and real estate allowed his family to live a comfortable life. Maud's home was always filled with family, family members who were drawn to her warm spirit and love of life. Although she had experienced a double tragedy, she never seemed sad and was always ready for adventure. She claimed she had a suitcase packed by the way and she could go on a vacation on 15 minutes notice. All she needed was a quick phone call and she would join any party. Like so many families from small towns like Buchanan, the four Peck children left the area as adults, although they came home often to spend time with their mother. My grandmother, Aline, and her husband, Dr. Robert Wells, an oral surgeon, lived for many years in Chicago. When he retired, they moved to the Wells homestead on Portage Prairie. All four Peck children are featured in my book. Many of Maud's descendants remember her as a woman who loved to travel, read, and take long walks in the woods around Buchanan. She subscribed to several news magazines, shared her knowledge of world events with her grandchildren. One of her favorite walks was to the Buchanan District Library, down the hill from her house on Clark Street. The librarian regularly called my great man, grandmother when a new book arrived that she thought seemed like Maud's cup of tea. When she passed away in 1957, when I was 10, the family asked for donations to the library in lieu of flowers. I recall good times with my great grandmother playing card games, board games, and Chinese checkers with her. We know about these four remarkable women, all born in the 19th century, because of the fifth one, my mother. Bonnie Wells, the oldest child of Robert and Aline Peck Wells, was born in Morgan Park on the south side of Chicago in 1921, nearly 100 years ago. She was a granddaughter of Maud Mowry and the great granddaughter of Lydia Harding. In 1942, she married Robert Wells, my father, the great grandson of both Henrietta Scharf and Maria Kepner. Bonnie was a bridge between Chicago and Buchanan, enjoying the bright lights of the 1933 Chicago World's Fair as a 12 year old. In fact, she wrote a letter that we have that's in the book from, um, from, her, to her, great, from her, her to her grandmother, Maud Mowry. She also appreciated the summers she spent with her grandmother, taking walks along McCoy's Creek in Buchanan. From Maud, she learned the names of every wildflower and the joy of reading a book from the Buchanan District Library or while sitting on a screened in porch swing. From her parents, she learned the love of family and sharing stories about those who are no longer with us. In 1950, my parents made a life altering decision. They moved from Chicago to Portage Prairie to build a house on the Wells family homestead and raise us in the country. Only four years later, my mother had become the hostess for holiday dinners. She's shown here in the family kitchen during Christmas 1954. Like generations before, the family's new life in the country changed abruptly seven years later. In 1957, my father had a heart attack at the age of 36. My sister had just turned 14. My brother was five. Although our father survived his early heart attack, our mother, also 36, faced the possibility of being widowed with young children, not unlike her grandmother and her great-grandmother's experiences. Our mother had it only an associate degree at the time and realized the family might not be able to rely, rely long-term on her husband's income. We learned later that our family doctor is Dr. Vastin, who um, I think many of you know, told her that he might not live into his 50s. Through sheer persistence, she completed bachelor's and master's degrees while working full-time at Electra Voice. With her degrees, she went on to teach third and fourth grades at Stark School for 15 years. Like the other four remarkable women in my family, she came to terms with her situation and took action. 
My siblings and I were fortunate to have both parents through our childhood, and we enjoy sharing individual versions that often conflict of some of the events we recall. Our father passed away in 1985, 28 years after his first heart attack. Our mother remarried a fellow parishioner from the Portage Prairie Church. Like her great grandmother, Lydia Ann, she married a joyful man, Raymond, who loved music. He even played the bagpipes, but only allowed to do so in the backyard. They were both voracious readers, curious about the world and enjoyed traveling. Our mother passed away in 1995 and 95 year old Raymond now lives with the daughter south of, in south of South Bend. Although my, my siblings and I live across the country from each other, we share the legacy of family history that our mother helped create beginning in 1976. Each summer, our mother would take on a major project. During the American Bicentennial, she focused on our family's history. She reached out to older members of her and my father's families. She asked them to write one page about their memories of a special relative or an event. She received stories about grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and others. Most family members, she asked, wrote one or two pages. Others wrote five or 10. Relatives also gave her photographs, diaries, and letters that had, they had stored in attics and basements. Using whatever sources were available to her, she created a family tree for both her family and my family, father's family. They went back to only about the Civil War, those trees. That treasure trove, carefully saved and labeled in file folders, formed the nucleus of my book, Mayflower to Michigan and Beyond, My Family's Journey. When siblings and cousins heard that I was writing the book, they were as generous as the previous generations, sharing some of their childhood memories. In addition, I see, received a grandfather's World War I diary from a nephew, photographs from cousins, and a magazine article that one of my uncles wrote. The archivist at the Buchanan District Library and the curator at the Niles History Center provided photographs as well that we did not have in our albums. As a result, my book is filled with stories like those five remarkable women who faced life challenges with grace, new passed on a heritage that I can now share with you and others. Mayflower to Michigan and Beyond, My Family's Journey will be released by Politics and Prose, an independent bookstore in Washington, DC later this month. I have one copy and um, the, the rest will be printed in the next couple of weeks and then be available at Politics and Prose. You can pre-order the book now through the link on this slide. I hope you will enjoy my family's journey as much as I have. Meg, I'm going to turn the microphone back to you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna just give me one second. Let me find the chat. Here we go. So Mary Lister asked, are all of these photos in the book, the ones that you shared during the- Almost all of them. There are a couple that aren't, but there are 55 illustrations in the book. So I just hit the tip of the iceberg here. For example, the um, trying to think of the, the, uh, the different slides. Most of them actually are from the book. There are one or two that isn't, aren't. For example, my mother as a teacher is not in the book, uh, but the the Pick family and many of the others are, are in the book. And you can get a copy of this if you want any of these photos. I'm happy to share those with you. Okay, great. If anyone else has any questions now, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, I wanted to ask, um, you know, do you have any advice for other people who might want to share their family history who might you know, be hearing you and thinking, oh, this is a wonderful idea to have relatives write down um, their memories and gather them. Do you have any other advice for people who are interested in that? Yes, first of all, let your friends, not your friends, your friends might be helpful as well, because I had one friend who had a, a subscription to newspaper.com and uh, she let me use her subscription. And what I found is that my family in Chicago loved, absolutely loved um, publicity. 
particularly my great grandfather, who was the, the sergeant who had the goat farm. And there were pictures and articles in newspapers that she tracked down for me. So that was very good. But what I would, I would suggest is it's hard to start the way my mother did by asking people to write down. People aren't inclined to do that much anymore, but at least let them know that you would love people to do that and write down, just tell them just one page would be good. The other is that um, although we're not gathered personally at Thanksgiving this year, if you have Zoom calls with your family, and go around the table, even if it's a Zoom table, and ask them each, uh, advise them ahead of time so they can think about it, but advise, ask them if they could tell a story about somebody special in their life. And you can tape that, and then you can transcribe it at some point. That might be easier for some people. The other is to look at the photos that you have. My goodness, I, I had I donated my um, grandfather's cousin's photograph album came into my hands, and that was um, that was really interesting to me because I knew this cousin very well. She lived up the road from us, but when we looked at the photographs in this album, they were labeled. Here's an example of a label all of us last summer. That was it. There was no way to know who these people were. So I donated that actually to the, the local history room at Buchanan Library because I thought there's somebody in Buchanan who's gonna know a lot of these people. So be sure that the photographs that you do have are labeled so you know who these people are. So that's one bit of advice. The other is to think about what are your, um, in business school, we call it distinctive competence. My distinctive competence is writing. I have been writing all my life. My career was writing. Um, I always wrote the, the energy report for the, the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. So for me, I looked at all this stuff that I'd inherited and I decided writing. But that's not the way you need to do it. You could do it by recording stories. You could do it by just writing individual stories yourself and ask people to do that. And then you assemble a book that's just a series of stories. I think photographs really help a lot. Um, the other thing is um, I have a friend who is um, also a Mayflower descendant and she did a picture book, just a picture book through something like Shutterfly where she had pictures of her ancestors and then wrote just a paragraph about them. I, I think that stories are more important than the birth, the death, um, so that's some of my advice. If someone has any other questions directed to that, I would be happy to answer them. It took me a while to figure out how to do it. And I spent a lot of time researching, used ancestry.com, although sometimes that's not correct, because I wanted to go back to, um, I did, I think 11 or 12 branches of my family. And I wanted to go back to the time that the first ancestor came to this country. So that's why I ended up thanks to my husband going back all the way to the Mayflower, I didn't realize that that was the earliest ancestor. So that's a, probably a lot that I just dumped on you, but there are, there's no one way to do this. I've suggested to my husband, for example, who knows a lot about his family, he's a Jamestown descendant. So um, his family came in, what, that, what is that? I don't even know, 1606 or something. I mean, even earlier, 1609, something like that. Um, I suggested for him that he just write, start writing short stories and put all those together into a book. Any other questions? Those are some really wonderful ideas. Thank you. We've got another question from Mary Alps who wonders in the Memorial Day picture, do you know where the house in Buchanan, do you know where in Buchanan this house was the, that they're in I, front of? I believe, I don't know. I'm sure it was in front of their own house. It was a, made into a postcard. So that makes me think they were in front of their house. I think that it was um, off, um, I'm thinking out loud here. I think it's about where the bank is now, the bank that has a drive-in window. It, I know it doesn't exist anymore. Um, they moved from that house but I, and it was torn down because my grandmother, when it was torn down, went over as they were demolishing it and wept and said, I want something from this house. And she took the doorbell. It was a doorbell that you cranked and below the doorbell was a little um, metal, almost like an envelope. It was, it's not an envelope because it was open. I don't know how to describe it, where you would put your calling card. 
you know, there was a bell and a calling card that was at, on the front of the door. And she took those away and put them on the farmhouse, the Wells farmhouse that's on today. It's still there, beautiful brick farmhouse on Bertrand Road. They moved from that house to a house on Front Street that is now the Presbyterian Church parking lot. And it was a big house that had a, a um, ballroom on the third floor. And it was, um, it was standing until the mid 1950s. And by that time, I think it had been broken up into apartments and it was torn down so that the Presbyterian Church could put in a parking lot. Wow. But the house on Clark Street is still there. It's in the middle of the block. If you're on Swim, the Swim funeral home, coming up the hill, you would turn left onto Clark and there's a little house with a side screened in porch. The screened in porch has probably been enclosed at this point. But the house okay. uh, in the book, actually, let me just, if I could expand a little bit, because once I get going on my family, we, we could have a very long evening here. Um, in the book, I have, I think it's 11 maps. The first set of maps show where um, the first ancestors came from. And it has, I know every village that my ancestors came from, from this country and that I could identify, but there are probably 35 ancestors and I have a little dot on the village that they came from in England or in Wales, Switzerland, Germany, Ireland, um, Canada, because one came from Canada. But in addition, I have a map that shows where they lived in Chicago, if any of you are from Chicago and are interested in Chicago, but where they lived at different times in Chicago. I know the house that my mother grew up in Chicago is still there. My father grew up on a family compound. His house is still there. And I think one of the other houses at least is still there. And um, a map of the compound and, the, and how you went, the relationship of the different houses to the, each other. And um, the house that my mother grew up in is still there. And the houses in Portage Prairie, I've marked all of those because the first I did this in the Berrien County Historical. My first ancestor came to the Buchanan or Berrien County area in 1834. That the Potawatomi, um, Chief Pokagon's tribe still live there, his band, Chief Pokagon's band. And my, my ancestors were bilingual. They spoke English and Potawatomi and were translators for Chief Pokagon. So our roots go back a long time. In, in the Buchanan and Bering County area. Perfect. I wanted to mention too that David, um, David Hadler thinks that maybe that the house you were originally referring to in the Memorial Day picture might've been on Dave's Avenue. Um, and that's, then Mary David Hitler, that's probably David Hitler. He must be on the call. That's my brother. Oh, okay. So that's right. Dave's Avenue makes sense. Okay. Um, and then Mary Lisi says, Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, I'm sorry. Mary Alves first said that the house that had been next to the Presbyterian Church had a fire, and that's why it was torn down. Oh, um, thank you for that. I'm sorry that it had the fire, but at least I know it wasn't just torn down so they could build the. It was the the um, parking lot happened because it was gone, not because they not because they needed a parking lot and tore it down. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Joni Mitchell will be horrified. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Uh, Mary Lisi says, do you think they lived at 108 West Front in the house um, near the, next to the ex, I'm sorry, next to the Lutheran Church? That house was torn down. Oh, so she wonders if it was the Lutheran Church, I guess, instead of the Presbyterian Church. Could be. Church. It would be, if you were on Clark going toward Front Street, it would be straight across, I think. I mean, I haven't been in Buchanan for a couple of years, but that's sort of what I recall. Um, it could be the Lutheran Church. I thought it was the Presbyterian, but I, you know, I could be wrong. I don't know. I don't remember where those things are any, right now. The house that, um, if you knew doctor, I don't remember our doctor. David might remember the name of our, the eye doctor in town on Front Street. It's a brick, big brick house on the south side of Front Street toward the top of the hill. That's where my great aunt Ida Bishop lived. Maud Maori's sister lived in that house. Ida Maori Bishop. 
And then our eye doctor lived there, whatever his name was. Hall, I feel like it was Dr. Hall, but that may not be right. Dr. Barnes is a suggestion. That sounds right. That does sound right, Dr. Barnes. Yeah, it's really hard to remember all this stuff. Thank goodness for the documentation I do have. Good thing you wrote a book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'll ask one more question, give everybody a chance to if, think if you have any last questions. Um, but did you come across any um, surprises when you were doing your research? Well, the biggest surprise was the Mayflower. I had written the first chapter of the book and said that our first ancestor arrived in 1623, and that was Ab Abraham Harding. And my husband was doing research on one of the ancestors. And he said, Susan, I noticed that one of the sources for this ancestor's information is Mayflower Society records. And if they're Mayflower Society records, they have been documented every which way from Sunday. And um, so he said, you must be an, a Mayflower ancestor. So then we did the research and found it, that was true. And I, my response, which was not very kind on my part was, I'm so sorry to hear that because I finished chapter one and it's supposed to start in 1623. Now I have to go back and do the Mayflower people. So, um, but that's exactly what I did. So I went back to Richard and Richard Warren and Elizabeth Warren were quite remarkable. And he died again, I didn't even mention that one, but he died pretty young. And she was given all of the rights and the finances that he would have received, which was very unusual. Usually the, the wife was kind of left out, out of luck when the husband died, but she must have been very well thought of and he must have been very well thought of that uh, she got everything that he had the right to have. So I would think that was the biggest surprise. My favorite person, which I know you didn't ask that question, is Price. Right. I am just absolutely in love with John Price Kepner. He weighed 123 pounds when he joined the Pennsylvania Lancers, which is a cavalry group, cavalry. Um, this a skinny young man on a horse. I mean, and he finally said, I can't take it anymore. And he wrote so many letters home that we have, many of them to his sister, who was the uh, Maria Ellis Kepner. And I have, um, I have copies of those letters. Those letters are in the Virginia Historical Society in Rich Richmond. But he was a, just a, an exquisite, exquisite writer and wrote about various battles. He talked about talking his way onto the, um, the, now I don't even remember, is it the monitor, the, the uh, Union ship, uh, the sort of the, the submarine, the Union, the iron ship in the Civil War. He talked about cold, cold harbor battle where he was riding a horse and had to deliver a message to a general and had to ride over dead bodies to deliver the messages with bullets all around his head. I mean, a just exquisite description of his experience in the Civil War. So he's kind of my favorite, I must admit. Anything right. else? Yeah, are there any other questions? Anything else anyone would If like not, to? I would like, I have a final comment to make. So um, I'm going to read from a letter to the editor of the Berrien County Record. I'm quoting, this is my Roberta Wells. Roberta Wells Trost, who is my mother's younger sister, and she was a columnist for the Berrien County Record, but she also read a letter, read, wrote a letter to the editor on August 20th, 1981. And this is what she wrote, which is just so true today, how, how many, what, 40 years, almost 40 years later. Let's see if I can get this. Okay, I love this town. This is my, my, my aunt writing. I love this town. Its friendly mood is contagious. We now have summer band concerts, a library bursting with growth and enthusiasm, and merchants who care about people and have tried to emulate the looks and atmosphere of the past. Take advantage. Use our library to trace your ancestry. Visit our cemetery, one of the most well-maintained and attractive I've ever seen. This is a town that deserves our love and sustenance. And please smile 
and greet one another as you walk, go about your work and play. A town that pulls together stays together. And I found that in her folder just the other day when I was going through looking for a photograph. I just thought it was just a lovely, lovely, um, lovely expression. So that is the end of anything that I wanna say and you're welcome to get in touch with me if you have any questions. The book, I signed off on the final book. I can show you, well, not easily. My husband has it in the other room. Uh, the, but the book is done. The order is placed with the publisher to begin printing. And the first batch of books should probably arrive at Politics and Prose in the next couple of weeks. I would say two to three weeks, allow it two to three weeks. Yep, that's great. And we will have a couple of copies at the at the Buchanan District Library, of course. So yes. All right, everyone. Thank you very thank much. You very much for, for joining us for this. Um, Susan's email was included um, in the email that I sent you. So if you uh, would like to reach out to her with other questions, you're welcome to. Um, and just thank you everyone for coming tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to do more of these. Um, so if you, anyone has any connections to um, other authors, please always feel free to let the library know. We love to host these kind of events. So. And Meg, thank you. Thank, thank you for doing the slides. That was so helpful to me. Thank you. Yep, no problem. All right, thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.